So thank you, and uh, I am indeed Michael Lloyd Trans from St. Paul, Minnesota, from the Traces Museum. Vanished is one of two dozen exhibits we've had up for the last three years in our museum in, in St. Paul. I'm here today, so is Eb Four. Eb Four was one of the thousands of people interned in Crystal City during World War II. There were, of course, German Americans, Japanese Americans, um, a few Italian Americans. We'll talk about that in a moment. Of interest for you, of course, will probably be there are also Latin Americans who were brought here by force. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. So normally you shouldn't start a program with a question, but I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that, well, first of all, anybody here have Mexican ancestors? <laughs> a couple of you have, all right, all right. The rest of you not, but a few of you have Mexican ancestors. Do you think that Mexicans could ever be deported from the United States in big numbers? Could they just be rounded up and deported? Yes, one woman says no, no. Could they, or you Could they be? No. No? It has happened. It has happened, and I'll tell you why. In the 30s, this man's been reading the, all right. I hear rather that they, they were sent, uh, they were born around Lake or somewhere to Bryan, and they, they were deported. The USA Today, which is not a leftist, rag by any means, I find it rather conservative. The USA Today about four years ago, three years ago, had a full page article on its feature section that in the 1930s, maybe 1932, 33, sort of the heart of the depression, hundreds of thousands of Mexican Americans rounded up in Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Southern California, Texas. They were put on uh, trains and buses and sent south. Even people in New Mexico who'd been here since the 1600s. People in Wyoming who'd been born there. So they figure between 250 to 330,000 Mexicans, people of Mexican or, uh, background at least, were put on trucks, buses, and planes, uh, trains, and sent back to Mexico. Why? People with their land, some of them had little farms. And what was going on in 1933, 32? The Great Depression. So, oh, we'll get rid of a few Mexicans, there'll be more jobs for us, which is ridiculous. So, I grew up very much in the Midwest with the fantasy that America was a white nation. So, a few, you know, people of color, well, we'll get rid of them, and it's that mindset. People are expendable. They're not real Americans, so just, if you need to, just send them away. Well, ironically, during World War II, German Americans were also put in camps, and that's the majority ethnic group. There's no ethnic group in the United States that claims more descendants than the Germans. I'm one of them. He's really one of them. Um, some of you will have German ancestry probably, a few of you at least. So if you can take people from the largest ethnic group and put them in camps, and some of them were deported, you can take anybody. Mexicans, Arabs, Jews, Irish policemen in Boston, any group. We don't want them. We don't need them. So our story today, at least mine, Ebbs will be different. My story is really about how do you take a group of people in the United States of America, put them in camps, and when you want to, deport them or treat them badly or don't give them a lawyer. So that's really the legacy of Crystal City for me. It's not about the Germans or the Japanese or the Italians. It could be Mexicans, Arabs, Jews, go down your list. So, I'm going to tell you a story today, and every time I say German-Americans, you might, in your mind, just insert your favorite group. What other group would you want to think about? And we live in a world of global warfare again, maybe it is a different group, and we don't even know about it. So that's our story on my clock, and then I'll give, it, give the, the floor to Ebb, is I'm talking about what's the process of taking away people's civil, liber civil liberties. No lawyer, no charges, no trials, no convictions, and no freedom. Okay, enough of that. Uh, if I shut off the light, would that be okay for the guy filming it, or would that be a, a disaster? No, and I don't even know where the light switch is. <coughs> Our story begins, really, the, the mid and late 1930s. It was clear that war clouds were gathering on the horizon, and in the United States, the government began to watch what it considered any enemy aliens or possible enemy aliens, people of German or Italian or other Axis power descent. And there were a lot of them. Can you imagine how many Italian Americans were in Brooklyn and Boston and Philadelphia and Baltimore? A lot. How many Germans? Wisconsin, Oregon, everywhere. St. Louis, a lot. 
So the government had to be somewhat careful to say, well, these people are potential enemies. The easiest target were those people who had just gotten off the boat. So if the German Americans had been here several generations or were clearly American citizens, it was less easy to push them around. But people who had just gotten off the boat, it's not so hard. For example, the German Americans, like I assume Japanese or, or other Axis nationalities, they had to swear oaths of allegiance. Before we even entered World War II, they also had to carry little ID books, and I think Ebb has his here. The ID books had name, fingerprint, when you were born, where you came from, where you live now, any distinguishing characteristics, like notice the part about the teeth. I actually met this man. Uh, he was living in Wichita, maybe still alive. At about that point, the government put up warnings, you know, and especially after Pearl Harbor, they were everywhere. Watch out for all the aliens. They could be dangerous. And indeed, right the night of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, so today minus how many years? Someone's math better than mine. It was a long time ago. All right. Today, that many years ago, the government actually began to round people up. Now, ironically, the government didn't round up very many Japanese Americans. The first ones we rounded up were Germans and some Italians, and we weren't even at war with them yet. It was the Japanese who had bombed Pearl Harbor. If you go to our website, traces.org, which I hope you'll do, you'll see that we've had over two dozen exhibits. And three of these exhibits, including this one, in fact, these are out of our bus, they have gone around the Midwest to 12 states in the Buseum, bus one and bus two. They're old school buses that we paint up, put in a new floor, typically we, we doll it up, we put in exhibit cases with uh, display panels. And one spring we were in Illinois, and this story was about to come to the uh, Bonneville Public Library somewhere east of St. Louis. And the librarian, which is what she was supposed to do, put an article in the paper that we were coming. And the story was about German Americans who were interned. A man called her immediately, an old guy, a Lithuanian Jew. Jack was his American name. I don't know what it was in Lithuanian. He'd come over in the 20s with his parents. He was an immigrant. He was in the Coast Guard. And on the night of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, in New York Harbor, he and another buddy were suddenly grabbed out of their um, um, at East State. All the other guys in the Coast Guard unit were in Manhattan chasing girls or having a beer, whatever. And these guys were still in the barracks, and their commander came in and said, we need you. They sent them to Ellis Island, and they didn't know what they were doing, and they were told, watch these Germans. So two guys with no guns were watching 600 Germans. They were rounded up that night in New York City on Pearl Harbor Day. Now, Pearl Harbor supposedly happened really quickly, unexpectedly. How did the government know who to round up? We know that as early as March 41, if not earlier, there were lists that were being compiled of who the government was watching and wanted, you know, in case of an emergency, we'd go round them up. And indeed, this guy found out 70 years later through our exhibit who those people were. He never knew. And I asked him, because I met him when we showed the bus, so Jack, what did you think of these guys? Well, I didn't understand why my buddy and I were supposed to guard them. They seemed harmless enough to us, but they were just there one night, and then they had regular guards who came and guarded them after that. Here in Kennedy, Texas, I think those are both Kennedy, Texas scenes, Crystal City, uh, I think there are about eight centers or camps in Texas, Sagoville. There was a detention center or a camp in uh, uh, Laredo, Fort Bliss, Fort Sam Houston. Is that Houston or is that San Antonio? San Antonio. San Antonio. All right, they're throughout the state. Sagoville is uh, suburban Dallas. Kennedy is somewhere up there. I'm from Iowa. I don't know your geography. So Texas was a big center of this whole project. I should also mention, as, as Ed might mention or, or confirm, this wasn't just one branch of the government. The Coast Guard was involved, Department of Justice, the in Interior, the Immigration Naturalization. You people know who they are. Um, I'm not very fond of them. Every, every time I go to the airport, I get hassled for one reason or another. So there were several federal agencies that were involved in this big program. That's why Ellis Island was an internment camp. One of our panels is about the internees at Ellis Island. But I'm ahead of my story. This is a map done by Art Jacobs, a friend of Ebb's. I've met Art. He lives in Tempe, Arizona now. He's a retired major from the Air Force. He's compiled this list. It's also here, by the way. 
of where the camps and centers were. What's the, the difference between a camp and a, and a center? The camps have barbed wire, watchtowers, guns, dogs, the whole bit. A center could be like in New Orleans, at the Jung Hotel in New Orleans, um, there was a hotel in Gloucester City, New Jersey. So some of the centers were just appropriated buildings, uh, a 4-H building maybe, or a theater in Ohio. In Cincinnati, Ohio, it was the local poorhouse. 